breaking the wall of uninformed cities. How open data makes urban life smarter. Ina Schieferdecker, Fraunhofer Focus, Berlin. My father's a Berliner and knew the city from the time before it was divided. When the wall came down, we took a long walk through West Berlin. When we came to the western city centre, he became very emotional and almost fainted. He was overwhelmed by the situation. I think that was the moment when I personally realised the impact of what was going on. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great challenge and a great pleasure to talk to you here. And I'd like to talk about breaking the wall of uninformed cities. I want to talk about how to open data in order to make our life in the urban environments easier. You may know this um, statement, but I like to repeat because it's really about what this is going about. We had the century of empires, we had the century of nation states, and we are about to enter the century of cities. Cities experience a strong competition for people, for business, for culture, for art. And indeed, in 2030, they're going to live more people in cities than in suburban environments. There, in 2020, it's almost double as many as today that live in cities. And here's a small picture which shows kind of the distribution of size of the cities. So you see a lot of mega cities with about 10 million people in Central and East America, in Asia, in near Asia, and also in Europe. So this is pretty much a common issue all over the world. And I took some examples. What are the challenges that come with these growing urban environments? There are massive flow of people. So I wanted to ask if you realize which cities these are. So one is uh, the World Championship on Soccer in Berlin, and the other is when the Pope visited Spain. So Berlin and Madrid. Oh, we do have flow of cars, traffic flows. These are traffic jams, I would say. One is in Beijing, the other is in Berlin. And one other example, there are of course also flows of events, potentially catastrophic events. Once again, you guess what, Berlin, and this time Kuala Lumpur. So, um, when I say breaking the wall of uninformed cities, so what is information? So, and I came across uh, this curve for computer science, which said that um, back in 1980, we learned to process data. Then we processed information and we um, manage the knowledge and we come up with intelligent choices. But in fact, I say it's time to get back to the basic data because that is a source where all the information, all the understanding, all the intelligence comes from. Don't talk about wisdom. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm young, too young for that. But it is to get back to um, a talk this morning. It's about getting to know what is going on. And indeed, in 2003, um, the European community put forward the Public Sector Information Directive, which is about opening up government data to the public for anyone, for any purpose, at no cost. And the Sunlight Foundation in U.S. put forward ten, uh, eight principles, sorry, eight principle that characterize uh, this data being opened. So it's about having complete data, primary data, data that is timely, accessible, and machine processable. It is about being non-discriminatory, non-proprietary, 
and license free. So in short, it's about opening data as we opened software, as we opened interfaces before in ICT. This time we want to get the original data, which is not yet inter interpreted by anyone, huh? in order to allow the interpretation by anyone. And then the other point is what is smart. That is even harder to explain. But I think I found a quite good explanation. This is not smart now. Um, could there be a battery problem? This is a receiver. Ah, oh, no, no, it's, it's working. Yeah. So uh, being smart is about <laughs> being capable of making adjustments that resemble human decisions. So I'm a computer scientist, so we try to rebuild the intelligence decision, decisions that are made by human beings so that uh, one can react to changing circumstances. In project management, SMART is even translated into being specific, measurable, accepted, realistic, and timely. So it's really about bringing the information about what is going on in the city in order to allow the right action. So it's not only to be intelligent, that's not enough, one needs to use the intelligence in order to improve things. And of course, these concepts are thought by quite different people in ICT. This is a picture from Siemens, from Telecom, from IBM, I guess you know it. And we try to um, explain it um, by a short animation, which you may start now. Our cities change, new cities emerge, they grow, become more and more complex, and become increasingly interconnected. In order to shape cities efficiently, four core issues are particularly important. Through communication, data and information are distributed, processed and understood. Energy provides people with light and heat. Safety offers stability and trustfulness and mobility allows for flexible and time-efficient travel. With a growing complexity and interconnectedness, the demands on the design of the city increase, not just in the future, but already today. Just think of a light signaling system at a large intersection. The traffic light directs the traffic and is thereby part of a complex system for the traffic flow management. But what happens if a traffic light does not function? Traffic comes to a standstill and nothing moves. Sensors and the modern communication technology in the car recognize the problem and submit it immediately to the city and its traffic control center. The information gets processed and transmitted so that approaching vehicles are given an advance warning. At the same time, an alternative route is suggested and the traffic jam circumnavigated. In addition, the problem at the intersection is bypassed and finally solved. Enough now. That way, important resources like energy running, and time but I are think preserved. You got an impression <laughs> what I wanted to say. So, uh, in the corner of the, or in the center, in the heart of these solutions is information and communication technologies, as Mr. Hütter said already. And in fact, it's not yet ready at hand. You may think that the internet is ready for that, but we need to interconnect all the things surrounding us. We need to get out the data, as I said. Then we uh, build up services on business on top, top of that, and which makes up, at the end, the future internet, as we call it. And um, as we establish this future internet, we uh, provide a nerve system for, a sy uh, for the city, which allows us to sense that network society we live in. This is a picture from the MIT, which I like to show at this point in time, because it really resembles this idea of getting to know what is going on. And once we have this information, 
uh, then we need to cope technically with an enormous amount of data. There's real-time data, we call it also big data, which need to turn into multimodal information for the people out of structured and unstructured data, out of heterogeneous sources and uh, different kinds of data. And um, maybe to give you a little of um, impression of what I'm talking about, so um, we had networking beforehand in 86 uh, using one-way broadcast networks, we could use 0.4 zettabytes, which is, uh, you know, I guess, megabyte, gigabyte. Then there's terabyte, um, petabyte, exabyte, zettabyte, right? Zettabytes. Another example is that if you would digitize all the speeches ever given, this brings us to 42 zettabytes. The internet is not yet at this uh, size, so in 2012, this year, it's uh, expected to grow to 2.7 zettabytes. Yeah, all the speeches, 42. So um, we are by far not ready to cope with this amount of data. And also it's quite a technical and research challenge. It's also a cultural challenge because um, Governors, for example, need to turn their way of coping with data from seeing it basically in the public and not in a confidential manner, to publicize the data, not to withhold it, and to give it for free use. So, for example, along um, given open data licenses. And we're all going to turn from the pure consumers into producers. We're going to have our own devices in our living environments, in our enterprises, whatever. So there are 10 billion electronic devices currently in Europe, out of which 95% are not yet connected to the Internet. I didn't count what this means. So I'm not talking about just about technical, but also political, legal, administrative, operational, and other implications that come along this opening, accessing of data. And in the center of this idea for a smaller city is, um, I call it the city data cloud, which brings together the open data, commercial data, and your private data, which hopefully sticks to your smartphone and is secured and everything. And um, there we do want to have a central place, central place for finding, but storing in a distributed, federated manner uh, the things, I need to hurry up, across different levels, so there are to be registry services, stores, portals, and visualization support, which we do, for example, for different European countries, where we do have um, platform behind the scenes, and which we put forward also as open source, because a kind for me, open data and open source need to go hand in hand. And then once uh, we do have the data, for example, in Berlin, where we launched uh, the first German open data portal last year, we do this time for Germany and gonna present uh, the portal there in at sea, but <coughs> next year, I know, but I had an interrupt. <laughs> um, it's about using the data. I mean, uh, opening the data sounds maybe a little boring, but it's fun, I tell you. But at the end, for every one of us, there are great um, possibilities to use the data. For example, to adjust uh, the green zone in a city to the current environmental and traffic situation, or to visit uh, the train progress in a city if we could switch on this train monitor, uh, that is by one of the data journalists in Germany, Lorenz Matzert, uh, which allows to see all the trains, so it's some internet problem. Anyway, it should be running trains now. The red ones are the ones that are delayed, and you can finger at uh, the trains and uh, see what is going on. We uh, developed solutions to fix the city. <laughs> I 
yes, <laughs> for the <laughs> emergency forces, there are data lenses uh, to get into more details of this huge amount of data. And of you course, there are numerous more ideas. Maybe we could uh, come up with application competitions as we did in Berlin, Germany, and Europe. And that allows me to say thank you. If I got your interest, maybe you join us for a scientific conference on the topic in a month. Would be nice. <laughs>